we're working on a set of skills here that are meant to solve a problem. The problem is, why is it that everything we do is for the sake of happiness? But we often end up causing pain and suffering. The Buddha gives two big frameworks for approaching this problem. In fact, they're the only ones of his teachings that he says are categorical. In other words, they're true across the board all the time, all situations. One is that unskillful behavior should be abandoned and skillful behavior should be developed. And the other is the Four Noble Truths, going into the unskillful behavior in the mind that's causing the suffering. and then seeing what kind of skillful behavior we can develop in its place so we can bring suffering to an end. That's basically the big framework for the problem. Now, the framework tells you a lot. The Buddha is saying that suffering comes from our actions. And particularly, unskillful actions in the mind, the craving and the clinging. And you can be brought to an end by developing actions that crave and cling in a different way. Crave to have right view, right resolve all the way down through right mindfulness and right concentration. That's a kind of craving there too, but it's a good one. It has to be the desire to develop the path, otherwise it doesn't happen. And the rest of the Buddhist teachings basically give more detail on those issues. And as I said, in some cases the detail is true across the board. In other cases, it really depends on the situation. Across the board, the Buddha says no killing, no stealing, no illicit sex, no lying, no harsh speech, no divisive speech, no idle chatter. Trying to avoid greed that goes out of bounds. Of course, that raises the question, what are the bounds? Greed that would require that you do things that are against the precepts in order to get what you want. Ill will, in other words, wanting to see other people suffer. And then avoiding wrong view, the wrong view that your actions don't make any difference. Generosity isn't worthwhile. Gratitude isn't worthwhile. Nobody knows what happens after death, so who cares? Those are the things you've got to avoid across the board. As you get into the Four Noble Truths, especially when we get into the Eightfold Path, there are specific instructions on how to get the mind into concentration by being mindful. But it's a pretty large outline with lots of spaces. And the Buddha indicates where some problems might be. And we've all run into the problems. Sometimes the mind is too sluggish, sometimes the mind is too restless. So that's one thing you've got to read right there as you're meditating. The John's often talk about just taking a survey of your mind before you sit down and to focus on the breath. In what direction is it headed? Is it sleepy? Is it drowsy? Well, there are ways of counteracting that. If you find that a particular topic puts you to sleep, well, change the topic. Now, this means with the breath, sometimes change the way you breathe, or change to another topic, something that engages the mind more, like the contemplation of the body or goodwill. Get up, walk around. In other words, do something to stir your juices a little bit, to wake yourself up. If you already have some concentration, think of the Awareness filling the body down to every little cell. And explore the parts of the body you don't usually pay attention to, say the areas between the toes, between the fingers. In other words, do something to make the breath interesting and have that full body awareness can be energizing. So these are things, however, that you have to play around with. 
because each person's situation is going to be different. This is why the Buddha gives such large outlines where there's spaces for you to fill in, because your situation today may differ from your situation tomorrow, and your situation right now may differ from the situation of the person sitting right next to you. So look and see what you need right now. If the mind is restless, this is when the Buddha, as the Buddha says, it needs to be steadied. First, remind yourself that the things you're restless about are not going to accomplish anything. All too often we're restless because we're worried about something in the future, or worried about some situation in the present moment. You can remind yourself that your worrying is not going to solve the problem. The problem gets solved by developing qualities of alertness, mindfulness, ardency, concentration, discernment, the things that we're supposed to work on as we meditate. So if you want to solve the problem, often it's good to work on your skills right here. The skills themselves, as you meditate, may not solve the problem on their own, but they give you the skill set that you're going to need when you actually have to start thinking about the problem. You can breathe in a way that calms you down. So you've got to read the situation, see what needs to be done. This involves getting a sense of the right time and the right place for things, which is a concept that the Buddha emphasizes many times. He said, with the factors for awakening, there are some factors of awakening that are energizing. Rapture. Effort. Taking an analytical attitude to what's going on in the mind. That'll wake you up. Taking an analytical attitude to what's going on in the body. That'll wake you up, too. Other things are more calming. Focusing on the parts of the body that seem more calm. Getting the mind more concentrated. Developing an attitude of equanimity. So you've got to read the situation. What's needed right now. The Buddha makes a comparison with trying to get a fire going. Sometimes the fire is too strong, so you've got to put ashes on it. Sometimes it's too weak, so you've got to put more fuel in. He makes a similar obs observation with the basis for success. Sometimes your desire is too much. Sometimes it's not enough. In other words, it's not focused on the right thing. You're supposed to be focused on the causes. And as for your desire for the results at the end, You've got to put them aside. You know they're there, but you don't focus on them. You focus on what you've got to do. And same with the other basis of success. You think persistence or effort may be too much, too little. The narrowness of your intent may be too much or too little. And your analysis may be too much or too little. So you've got to figure out what's right for here, right now. And the results will be the way you judge what's right for here right now. In other words, what happens as a result. This is why evaluation plays such an important role in the meditation. You do something and you look at the results. Are they good enough? If you're not sure, we'll just keep doing them until it becomes clearer. And if it's not right, well, then you can change. It's in this way that your discernment gets developed. Sometimes you hear that tranquility meditation is one thing and insight meditation is something else. But the Buddha never taught it that way. He said you do concentration, and it's going to require a certain amount of tranquility and a certain amount of insight. And where does the insight come in? It comes in seeing the connections between what you're doing, the results you're getting, and judging them as to whether they're good enough or not. And your sense of what's good enough should develop over time. You see there's any disturbance in the mind? Okay, that's a potential problem. You ask yourself, to what extent am I contributing to that? That's actually applying the Four Noble Truths to a very immediate problem. The Four Noble Truths are not some object that you put up on a table and worship. They're tools for analyzing problems. 
The problem is this, if there's anything weighing the mind down or anything that seems not quite right in the mind, what are you doing? It keeps focusing you back on your actions. And that's the kind of knowledge that, while we're doing the meditation, counts as real knowledge. Other kinds of knowledge can be very detailed, but if they don't fall into that framework, what are you doing is causing suffering, what are you doing that can put an end to suffering? If they don't fall into that framework, then it counts as ignorance, as far as the Buddha is concerned, particularly with regard to this problem that we're trying to solve. So a lot of the practice is the same with, as with any skill. If you're a carpenter, you're planting a piece of wood, how much pressure do you put on? How much is too much? How much is too little? Well, you learn from doing. When you're cooking, how much salt is too much? How much is too little? Well, you learn from doing. Keeping in mind that basic principle that if there's a problem, you want to look back on your own actions. Now, this doesn't mean that other people are not creating problems for you. But the big problem, the problem is, why is it that your actions create suffering? That's the problem that is really worth pursuing. The same principle applies in daily life. You have to look at your actions. Here again, you go back to the precepts. You go back to the Buddha's basic teachings on what he calls the, the guidelines, the ten guidelines. No killing, no stealing, no illicit sex, no lying, no harsh speech, no divisive speech, no idle chatter, no inordinate greed, no ill will, and avoiding wrong views. That's the basic outline. Now, there's lots of things that are not covered by that outline, or that are, the outline is kind of a sketch, and they're big blank areas, and those are the areas where you have to use your own judgment. But again, the judgment is based on what am I doing that's leading to unnecessary problems for the mind? And how can I stop? And so to what extent do you, as you go out into daily life, do you spend all your time meditating? To what extent do you deal with other people? That's something you're going to have to find out for yourself. But notice the way to judge it is what impact is it having on your mind? Now John Fung was talking about how some people go out in the world and they try to do so much to help the world. And there reaches a point, though, where their goodness breaks, as he said. They totally give up. They say they can't do this, they have no energy anymore. That's well, a sign they haven't been watching themselves all along. If you know how to watch yourself, you say, okay, this, in this case I'm getting too involved, I've got to pull back. Or in this case, more needs to be done right now. There are no hard and fast rules, but there is that basic rule. Look at what you're doing and what can you change. In some cases, there are things happening in the world that you cannot change, tasks that you have to take on regardless of what you may think you would like to take on. There's work that has to be done, and you do it. And John Fuang every now and then would spring work projects on us. At the end of the meal, he'd come in and say, okay, and today we're going to do X. And sometimes it would require the entire day. One time it went from 8 a.m. to 4 a.m., working on a cement pouring. And there are times like that we say, okay, I've got to forget totally about my plans for my meditation schedule today. Just got to do what needs to be done. And so you do it. But while you're doing it, you're trying to develop what inner strength you have. Think of your meditation. Think of your, your breath and what you've learned about making the breath energized inside and give the mind a place where it can stay. Because even when you're doing work, how much of your attention really is on the work? I'll take that part that's not on your work and devote it to the breath. 
Because some jobs require 100% of your attention, so we give them 100% of your attention. Others require maybe 30%, 20%. We'll give the remaining 70 or 80% to the breath. So your mind can have a place where it can nourish itself, gain some sustenance. Remember that not, not all the skills though, of the practice are related to meditation. Some of them have to do with the other perfections you can develop, qualities like endurance, patience, determination, goodwill, developing these qualities is also part of the practice. And also remind yourself of that teaching about the acrobats. The Buddha tells the story of two acrobats, one standing on the top of a bamboo pole and the other standing on top of his shoulders. And the one below tells the one above, okay, you look out after me and I'll look out after you. That way we'll get down from the pole safely. And the other one says, no, that's not going to work. I'll look out after myself, you look out after yourself. We'll get down from the pole safely. And the Buddha said, in that particular case, the, the person on top was right. You maintain your balance and helps other people maintain their balance. But he said there are also cases where looking after another person helps with your practice, when you're kind, when you show patience, when you develop equanimity, goodwill in your dealings with other people. That strengthens your mind, strengthens the goodness of your mind. This is an important principle. We have to remember that this skill we're doing here is not just technique. It involves a lot of the qualities that we would say are a good heart, qualities of a good heart. And we live in a culture where that's not really prized. You look at the people, captains of industry, captains of government, whatnot, they didn't rise to their position out of a good heart. So it's in this way that the practice has to be countercultural. You have to stand outside the culture a bit. But there is a part of every human culture that does value a good heart. So to that extent, you're still part of the culture. What Buddhism does is it emphasizes, emphasizes the good heart as much as possible. Because basically that's what the desire to put an end to suffering comes down to. You want to find happiness in a way that doesn't harm anybody. That's a good-hearted desire. You want to find a happiness that's really worthwhile. In other words, it will last. That's a good-hearted desire, too. What the Buddha is offering is a large framework for approaching the question of how to maintain that good heart and get results. Once you've got the larger framework, in other words, that the problem's there, even though other people may be contributing the problem, the problem that's causing you suffering can be traced back to your actions. You keep looking back to your actions. If you don't like the results you're getting right now, go back and change what you're doing. Look again. And it's that way that you learn. You gain a sense of what is the right time for engaging with other people, what is the right time for meditating. And when you're meditating, what's the right time to work on developing more energy in the practice? What time is the right time to be more analytical in the practice? What time is the time to be more still? With practice, you gain a sense of these things. And the Buddha is there to offer you the, the framework for knowing what to look for, and offering you a range of skills to apply. When you figure out, oh, this is the problem right now, this is what you do right now. So it's not leaving you to keep reinventing the Dharma wheel all the time, but it does expect you to use your powers of discernment, your powers of observation. Because otherwise, if everything were all laid out, insert slot A into tab B, 
So you want the other way around. Insert, insert tab A into slot B, where everything is all pre-cut and just all you have to do is just assemble it. It'd be foolproof. And there's no way that a there are no foolproof way to awakening. We may be foolish already as we start, but part of the practice is to teach us how to be more sensitive, more wise, more alert to what's the right time, what's the right place. That's how our discernment develops, and it's through discernment that the problem gets solved. 